D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, the greatest seaborne invasion in history. By the end of the longest day, more than 170,000 Allied troops had been landed on the Normandy beaches to launch the liberation of Europe. Thousands more would follow. But without a steady stream of supplies, they could not hope to secure their position and move inland. Every battle depends on supplies. Men, guns, ammunition, food. No supplies, no battle. To unload the vital cargo would need large harbors. But the Germans held the French ports, so the invaders simply floated their own across the English Channel. They were codenamed Mulberries, gigantic construction kits of steel and concrete. Many said they would never work. Wind and waves almost proved them right. But ingenuity and determination saved the day. They just had to design from scratch and hope for the best. After all, the whole thing was a, a hell of a gamble. No one had ever taken a harbor across the ocean before. Using archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations tells the story of one of the boldest plans ever conceived in wartime, the building of the Mulberry Harbors. In the summer of 1942, Adolf Hitler seemed invincible. His forces controlled mainland Europe and huge areas of the Soviet Union. Only the island fortress of Great Britain had managed to resist the German invaders. Now it would become the launch pad for the Second Front, the Allied liberation of Europe. It would not be easy. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was a seasoned politician but he was also a fighter who refused to contemplate defeat. He believed in plain speaking and direct action. He did have the most terrific effect on the morale of everybody. And he always seemed to say the right things at the right moment. What kind of a people do they think we are? <laughs> Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget. We kept our spirits up. We knew that we were going somewhere in the right direction. And even when things were going wrong, he still encouraged us. He was a great man. He quickly established a close bond with American President Franklin Roosevelt. With these two formidable leaders at the helm, the Allies began planning the assault on Fortress Europe. Here we are, together, facing a group of mighty foes who seek our ruin. Here we are, together, defending all that to free men is dear. Soon, American forces began arriving in Britain to create the huge buildup of Allied military power needed to liberate mainland Europe. Churchill knew that any invasion was likely to involve beach landings in shallow water. He also knew how easily things could go wrong. In May 1942, Churchill wrote an historic memo to his chief of combined operations. Fears for use on beaches. They must float up and down with the tide. The anchor problem must be mastered. Give me the best solution worked out. Don't argue the matter. The difficulties will argue for themselves. Truly Churchillian way of telling people to get on with things. The problem was passed to a department of the British War Office called Transportation 5. Its leader was a civil engineer with a wealth of experience when it came to building military ports, Brigadier Bruce White. He was a very dynamic person, uh, not to say abrasive, 
and um, it was just what was wanted. In August 1942, the harbour project suddenly moved to the top of the agenda. When Allied forces attempted a seaborne attack on the heavily defended French port of Dieppe. The raid was an act of extraordinary heroism, which achieved nothing except to confirm the impossibility of capturing any port held by the Germans. They announced that if we hold the ports, we hold Europe, and they were absolutely correct. And that was the position of the planners in 1942. And they came to the conclusion that unless we can have a port, there would be no invasion. A beach landing with floating piers seemed the only answer. But would they work? Winston Churchill took a keen interest in the progress of his pet project and was constantly pressing for action. They began to realize that, bloody-minded though he was, he was really talking a lot of sense. And he did inspire people to give of their best. In June 1943, the coast of Normandy was chosen for the D-Day invasion codenamed Operation Overlord. The American military planners believed that the operation could be supplied by landing craft, discharging directly onto open beaches. But Churchill still believed that his floating piers would be essential. In August 1943, he was crossing the Atlantic on board the liner Queen Mary, en route to the Quebec conference with President Roosevelt. One of the ship's bathrooms was used to stage an impromptu demonstration of the need for a sheltered harbor to protect the unloading operation. Several paper boats were launched in the bath and were quickly swamped by creating waves with the aid of a roll of newspaper. But when a loofah was placed across the bath to represent a breakwater, the boats survived the waves and Churchill was convinced. Now he had to convince the Americans. Unsurprisingly, I think the American military had mixed views about the need for the Mulberry Harbors. Uh, General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, mentioned in his memoirs that when the proposal was first broached to have Mulberry artificial harbors uh, to back up the Normandy invasion, that it was greeted by hoots and jeers by the assembled military and naval officers. The American chiefs of staff were not very much in favor of it. They thought that they could do a landing over the beaches. They had great experience of their Pacific landings, but those had not been on the gigantic scale of the Operation Overlord. And they, they really believed that they could do it without the harbor. However, they gave way to Mr. Churchill and said, all right, if you want this project, we'll go along with you. They began to see that the harbor could provide a valuable insurance policy against bad weather, while also avoiding the need to capture a heavily defended French port. And Roosevelt saw no reason to antagonize his closest ally by opposing the British scheme. A joint plan was agreed. The components for two artificial harbors would be built in Britain, one for the British and one for the Americans. The top secret project codenamed Mulberry, would be given the highest priority. The planners now faced a major challenge. And that was to design the pieces for two great harbors, to construct the pieces for the two harbors all over the United Kingdom, to assemble the pieces on the English south coast, to tow the pieces one by one through a hundred miles of German-infested sea to the French coast and to plant the pieces at Aramanche in the British sector and at Omaha Beach in the American sector. That was the operation which was codenamed Marlborough. This gave the green light for development work on a whole series of schemes, some good, some wildly impractical. Tough decisions would have to be made and made quickly. The invasion was scheduled for May 1944. Two gigantic artificial harbors, each one bigger than New York Central Park, 
would have to be designed and built in just nine months. Invasion. What does it cost? What's the ransom for a continent? Weapons. 18 million tons, 50 million tons. Men. Ships to carry the men. And two gigantic artificial harbors. A harbor needs a key which usually remains fixed while the ship rises and falls with the tide. But this causes problems when unloading and Winston Churchill had demanded a pier that would also float up and down with the ship. The Mulberry designers responded with the spud pontoon. These were massive floating pierheads, 200 foot long by 60 foot wide. They were to be built of steel and fitted with four legs called spuds, planted firmly on the seabed and standing almost 100 foot high. Held in position by the legs, the floating pontoons would rise and fall with the tide. It was new, it was radical, and it was exactly what Churchill had demanded. He was an adventurer, and anything brand new and novel, he really thought was the cat's whiskers. They were a marvellous piece of engineering, and we saw these actually working. And they were extremely curious, very clever, very clever indeed. But the pierhead would have to be linked to the shore by a long roadway, strong enough to carry heavy vehicles and able to survive in a heavy sea. The problem was passed to a talented young bridging engineer, Major Alan Beckett. If you're going to make an invasion on a beach, you've got to get it right. You've got to have the tides right, the water depth right, and the gear right, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's no good going along with improvised gear. Within a week, he had designed a flexible bridge span to be carried on floats and produced a scale model to demonstrate how it would work. Normal girder bridges are firmly braced to resist distortion. The secret of Alan Beckett's bridge was its combination of great strength and flexibility. It was designed to carry tanks weighing more than 30 tons, while twisting, rising and falling as it rode the waves. The spans were to be linked together with steel cables and heavy-duty ball and socket joints, which rested on the supporting floats, also designed by Beckett. These would be anchored to the seabed. It was a bold yet brilliantly simple design, which impressed everybody who saw it demonstrated, including Churchill. He had also issued another challenge to the designers, to master the problem of anchoring the structure to the seabed. When Winston said something should be done, something has got to be done, and that's the way it works. The challenge was to hold the floating roadway firmly in position without the anchors dragging in rough weather. It was a tough assignment. Once again, it was Alan Beckett who came up with the answer. By experimenting with models made of thin sheet metal, he produced a novel design of lightweight anchor. A full-size version was then passed to the Royal Navy for testing. Much to their surprise, it proved to be far stronger than their own testing equipment. The harder it was pulled, the more firmly Beckett's anchor buried itself in the seabed. It was very, very clever, very clever indeed. And it didn't fail. It worked wonderfully. Churchill's anchor problem had been mastered by a young engineer with an inventive mind. The Royal Navy, for all its long seafaring tradition, could only watch and wonder how on earth the army had managed to do it. Alan Beckett and the other engineers and designers who were associated with the Mulberry's uh, project were absolutely brilliant in how they did their work. I mean, this, this was a phenomenal feat of construction, a phenomenal feat in British engineering history.
To protect the pierheads and their floating roadways, some form of breakwater was essential. Obsolete ships would be sunk in a line to provide some shelter as quickly as possible. The line would be extended by sinking giant concrete blockhouses known as caissons. These monsters, weighing up to 6,000 tons, would be built in Britain, floated across the channel, and sunk end to end, forming a solid harbor wall. But although firm plans were now in place, the Mulberry Command structure was beginning to develop some serious fault lines. The Royal Navy felt increasingly excluded from the project. The Navy would originally have liked to design the whole thing, but they didn't. The Army designed the concrete caissons, the Army designed the floating quays, the Army designed the floating roadways. But <laughs> the Navy felt that they ought to have something to do with the design. They decided to build floating breakwaters, gigantic cross-shaped tanks, 200 feet long and made of steel. They would be anchored in deep water, forming a protective barrier outside the harbor wall. The army was not enthusiastic. To help disguise their purpose, the components were given a confusing list of code names chosen at random. Bombardons and phoenixes, whales and beetles, corn cobs and gooseberries, all went into the making of the mulberries. I do remember at one planning meeting where quite a senior officer leant over me and said, I can't remember these code names. Write them out in English, <laughs> which would have been fatal. Top secret, as we used to say lightheartedly, burn before reading. It was so secret. But that was the Operation Codename Mulberry. With the Mulberry plans prepared, it was time for action. There were now just six months left to build it. In May 1942, Mr. Churchill wrote a memorandum on the subject of piers for beaches. A harbor was essential. But if we could not capture one, then we must build our own we would build great harbour units in England, tow them across the sea, and set them down during the Battle of the Normandy Coast. Late in 1943, the huge task of constructing the Mulberry Harbours got underway. The plan demanded 147 concrete caissons, 10 miles of Alan Beckett's floating bridge sections, 23 pierheads, the list was endless, Yet the whole vast undertaking was designed to be no more than a temporary solution. Mulberry had a planned lifespan of only 90 days. In the months before D-Day, of 45,000 workers employed on the Mulberry project, almost half were building the concrete caissons, codenamed Phoenixes. It is a remarkable thing that we managed to mobilize so many people. Finding the materials? How many thousands of tons, I don't know. And uh, all the skill that's required from the simple labourer up to the engineers. It was quite an achievement to build them and to build them so quickly. Yet the planners of Mulberry often seemed more interested in obstructing each other than in getting the job done. As the caissons took to the water, the Admiralty claimed that, concrete or not, they were now ships and under its control. Bruce White insisted that they still belonged to the army and flatly refused to hand them over. Tempers flared and insults flew. To help restore the peace, Brigadier Mervyn Walter was appointed as director of ports and waterways. It was a daunting task. Well, I went and saw Brigadier Bruce White that morning, and he told me, unless the project was under the control of the army, not the navy, it would fail. And after lunch, I had a meeting with the Admiralty, and they told me, the whole thing will fail unless you get rid of Bruce White. 
But whoever was in charge, Churchill had no intention of letting it fail. Don't argue the matter, he had said. The difficulties will argue for themselves. Churchill was obviously the dynamic force behind the whole thing. And one felt right down at my level that he really was terribly interested in this thing and it really would be a very good thing if it succeeded. The pace of the operation was relentless and work continued round the clock. Many of the pier heads were built in Scotland. They were 200 feet long, 1,000 tons in weight. These boats were like beavers. People who had never been probably in sight of the sea, building and launching boats. But that was the condition in which they were built. And we had eight months to do it, and we did it. The whole nation seems somehow to be driven by another kind of vim and vitality. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. The thing that kept us going was Winston Churchill. He was a great man, the man for the hour. Don't argue the matter. The difficulties will argue for them, and he was right, will argue for themselves. And he was right there, and they did. I felt they spoke for the nation. He inspired us. This had to be done. It was demanded of us. And by God, we felt his presence. As long as we have faith in our cause and uh, an unconquerable willpower, salvation will not be denied us. But the pace was beginning to take its toll. Mulberry was straining Britain's industrial capacity to its very limits, and the schedule began to slip. The military planners became seriously worried and made desperate requests for early delivery. The Americans were concerned as uh, the weeks went on in May of 1944 that the materials would not be finished in time, uh, that, that the organization would not be set in place to bring the material over to France. That was important because the American Seabees, the naval construction men who had to install the American Mulberry, needed to train, and obviously the more training one has, the better he prepared he is to carry it out. Uh, there was very little time toward the end of May to carry out this training. At the beginning of 1944, General Dwight D. Eisenhower had been appointed Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. His task was to finalize the plans for Operation Overlord, now scheduled for the beginning of June. Eisenhower believed that Mulberry would play a vital role in the onslaught, speeding up the huge supply operation as well as providing an insurance policy against bad weather. Meanwhile, across the channel, the Germans were also working round the clock, preparing for the invasion they all knew was coming. Hitler ordered his favorite general, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, to strengthen the defenses along the coast of northern France. The Germans were missing two vital pieces of information, when and where the Allies would strike. But Rommel had one clear objective, to ensure that no man, weapon, or piece of equipment would ever reach the shore. Never was any military project more thoroughly prepared than the invasion of Europe. Great storehouses are packed to capacity with engines of war and food for the enormous army now assembled in Britain. The well-nigh illimitable productive resources of the United States and Britain are behind the invasion. When the armies land in Europe, they'll lack nothing that it's in the power of Britain and America to provide. The supply operation was on a gigantic scale. Millions of tons would be needed as the beachheads were secured and the breakout began. As the Allied troops gazed in wonder at the sheer scale of the invasion buildup, mysterious floating shapes caught their eye. The first thing I saw was a huge office block with no windows, no doors. It was just a great big concrete box, 60 foot high, 
60 foot wide and 200 feet long, and looked like a giant egg box. The biggest jigsaw puzzle ever created was starting to come together. They put me on board, and I was given a delivery note, believe it or not. So I clambered up on the top, but well, quite honestly, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I had no instructions. It did not occur to us at that time that this thing floated. And we were amazed that the tug that was tied up to us suddenly started pulling, and we moved. Well, having looked round at the situation I'd found myself in, I realised that I was the senior hand. In other words, I was the captain of the concrete. The final destination for the caissons was still top secret. They were to be towed across the English Channel to form the harbour walls of Mulberry B at Aramanche and Mulberry A at Omaha Beach. Brigadier Mervyn Walter was to be in charge of assembling and operating the British harbour, Mulberry B. The British Chiefs of Staff wrote this. The Mulberry project is so vital that it must be considered the crux of the whole operation and it must not fail. And that, those high and fluting words were drummed into me from the start, that this project must not fail. As the first waves of Allied troops hit the Normandy beaches on June the 6th, 1944, to begin the liberation of Europe, they carried basic equipment and rations for only 48 hours. To back them up and secure the invasion beaches, a huge supply operation was already on the move. It was a wonderful sight. You couldn't move for ships. And obviously something very big was on and we were part of it. But we still didn't know what part at that point. It was quite a calm sea, but it was a lovely dawn, and the spectacle of these uh, ships in convoy going across, it was really most encouraging. And the aircraft going over above us, plane after plane of the Allies, and gliders, oh, it was a wonderful sight. If I'd been the Germans, I should have been very worried. <laughs> and possibly very confused, for behind the warships and the troop carriers of the invasion fleet came a procession of tugs, hauling some of the most unlikely looking objects ever to put to sea. There's one thing I've never forgotten to this day, and that was, of course, the sound of the waves banging against the side on the front of these caissons. It was like a huge drum, and there was a huge boom, boom, boom going on all the time. We sailed actually on D-Day, but we didn't get there till D-Day plus one. And uh, there was still a lot of fighting going on, and one or two explosions. It was quite frightening at times. And the other thing that we'd noticed as we came into Aramorge was the bodies in the water. That was not a nice sight. After more than 24 hours at sea, the Mulberry Harbors had finally reached the enemy coast. Now, Brigadier Walter's task began in earnest. I've never forgotten my very first sight of Aramanche that morning, exactly like the photographs we'd studied before D-Day. And I can still remember my excitement because the challenge was on. It was very exciting. One of Brigadier Walter's first tasks was to breach the sea wall at Aramanche and to demolish buildings on the promenade to create exits for the floating roadways. The quiet seaside resort was about to be transformed into the busiest port in Europe. Marlborough's moment had come at last. The first sections of breakwater were formed by sinking lines of obsolete ships with explosive charges. Then the concrete caissons were moved into position 
to extend the breakwaters to their full length of more than two miles. There was already a couple, at least there, in line. And the tug nudged us into position. And with ropes and tackle and so forth, between the different ones, we lined them up and we heaved and we pulled and straightened things up to make a, a huge wall to this harbour. And all the sluices were opened, all the sea valves, and she gradually settled down onto the sandy floor. And that was that. And then we'd fetch another one. And so it went on. I don't think it really sank in until we saw things unfolding in their proper order that we realised that this was a harbour we were building. Meanwhile, along the coast of the American harbour, Mulberry A, the construction battalions, known to every GI as the CBs, were working flat out to get the floating piers operational even if it meant cutting a few corners in the process. The CBs soon outpaced the British Royal Engineers, and within two days, American tanks and trucks began rumbling down Alan Beckett's floating roadways. It was a great thrill for me to see, that actually, uh, as I thought it would be, built early, immediately after the... Um, the landing with very, very little time interval, because that time interval is the time that the enemy will regroup. And the idea behind the whole of Mulberry Harbour was to get armour ashore quickly, before the, the counterattack, and they did that. They did it so quickly, within two days. Incredible? Yes even to Americans steeped in traditions of pioneer courage and mechanical genius. Almost unreal, but real enough to the trucks that rolled down the sturdy ramps with their rations and big guns and shells made in America, on tires made in America. Real enough to the men who are America and to the 90,000 troops on shore who waited for all these. The Americans did it the right way, handled the thing the way I thought it was going to be handled. The Americans, because they had come to the war with untold resources, were not as conscious of losing this material. It was considered battlefield expendable. So the Americans did not spend the time to anchor the equipment and really lavish concern on it, because once it had served its purpose, that is getting ashore tanks, and that was very critical, tanks and equipment for the first one or two weeks, the Americans were less concerned about the follow-on than the British. At the British harbour, the construction rate was slower, but the work was far more thorough. Mervyn Walter ensured that as each new delivery was towed into position, the whole gigantic construction kit which formed the piers and their roadways was securely lashed together and firmly anchored to the seabed. Unloading from the main pier was just beginning. Then the wind began to blow, and on the 13th day of the invasion, the treacherous sea became Hitler's ally. Unloading on the open beaches ceased, yet somehow or other, the work of unloading in the port went on. The American harbor was in a more exposed position than Mulberry B, yet its builders seriously underestimated the power of the ocean, despite urgent warnings from Alan Beckett. Beckett warned them. He said, we must put anchors on every pontoon of our floating roadway. But they thought they knew better, and they only put anchors every sixth pontoon. Thirteen days after the invasion, the worst storm in living memory hit the coast of Normandy and the Mulberry Harbors. As storm force winds lashed the Normandy coast, Brigadier Walter's men at Mulberry B now risked their lives to save the harbor they had worked so hard to build. With the uh, roadway doing this and this, and eight-foot waves coming over it, pure purgatory during that time, 
We, I lost about eight sappers drowned, washed overboard, but they, they stood by, absolutely wonderful. The lads who were on Mulberry, as far as it had been built then, just worked their guts out to save it. Soon, many of the 300-ton Bombardon floating breakwaters snapped their moorings and began drifting towards the fragile concrete caissons that formed the harbour wall. Unfortunately, they got out of control and they more or less smashed things up. They were no help whatsoever. That was very unfortunate. For four days and nights, the pounding continued. I was so tired, my officer said to me, I said every order twice or three times to make sure I'd, I said it right, you know. One was so tired, it was every man jack of that port construction force threw his heart and soul into saving the harbour. But it was a very, very <sighs> testing time. Yet even during the height of the storm, more than 6,000 tonnes of vital supplies were unloaded and sent to the front. They were still able to get things ashore in that storm because the harbour wall held on Mowbray B. Otherwise, they could have been shoved back into the sea because they ran out of bullets, or they ran out of food, or they ran out of something or other that they needed. By June the 22nd, the storm had eased at last, and it was possible to take stock of the situation. The Navy bombardiers, I saw <laughs> the other side of Aramash, against the cliffside. The harbour was badly damaged. But thanks to all the precautions, Mulberry B had survived. Along the coast at Omaha Beach, it was a very different story. I went over to Omaha on the 23rd of June to see how they'd got on, and it was just a tangle of steel, uh, completely wiped out. The floating breakwaters had come crashing in to shatter the concrete caissons of Mulberry A. The poorly anchored floating roadways had also broken free and drifted into a tangled mass of twisted steel. Two entire pierheads had been swept ashore. The weather had done what the Germans had failed to do. Eisenhower was left with no choice. The floating piers at Mulberry A would have to be abandoned. Their surviving sections could help restore Mulberry B, but the damaged harbor wall still provided enough shelter to unload ships directly onto the beach, and huge quantities of supplies continued to come ashore in spite of the devastation. As the British harbour at Aramange was reinstated, a steady stream of vital war materials poured from the holds of the freighters and landing ships that now shuttled across the English Channel. It was really most encouraging because up to that moment, there had been sporadic landings of stores, but nothing very much. And when you once saw what the capacity of the harbour itself was, it was really terribly encouraging. One of the most successful features of Mulberry was the LST pierhead, designed for unloading the big tank landing ships. Vehicles could be driven off the lower and upper decks at the same time, which speeded up the whole operation. And Mulberry also provided shelter for the versatile amphibious trucks known as ducks, which were able to operate a non-stop shuttle between the ships and supply dumps in land. Soon they were transporting even more material than the floating roadways. 
two and a half million personnel pass through the harbour both ways. Half a million tanks, guns and vehicles came down Allen's floating roadways and over four million tonnes of supplies came through the harbour. If it hadn't been for Mulberry, there would have been a devastating gap in the flow of supplies to the armies on the ground. And what effect that would have had, I don't know, but it would certainly have slowed up the advance. It might even have caused some tactical disaster. Winston Churchill's floating piers had ultimately done the job, and Mulberry soon became known simply as Port Winston. He came to inspect the Mulberry Harbour and, of course, I gave him a cracking salute and he said, well done, my boy. That moment I was up in the clouds. <laughs> For the first time in history, a harbour had been built in sections, towed across the sea and set down during a battle on the enemy shore. Throughout the summer of 1944, stores continued to pour through the harbour at Aramanche before it finally ceased operations on November the 19th. By this time, the Allied advance had reached Holland and the major port of Antwerp had been captured. During the breakout phase, and this is from June all the way through November of 1944, Mulberry Bay kept functioning and kept uh, equipment and ve wheeled vehicles, supplies were coming ashore through Mulberry Bay and then pumped forward to sustain the offensive that ultimately defeated Germany. Supreme Allied Headquarters he said this of Mulberry Bay. Mulberry Bay did far more than the job for which it was intended and in spite of storms far greater than those for which it was designed it is the success story of a military and naval operation unsurpassed in the history of warfare. Today, visitors to the peaceful seaside town of Aramanche may not realize that it once bore the name of Port Winston. But they can hardly miss the monuments to Churchill's vision that still survive cast in reinforced concrete. They are Phoenix caissons, the last surviving fragments of the greatest feat of military engineering in modern times. Mulberry, the harbor that went to France. Afterwards, we began to feel very proud of what we'd done. However small our part was, a very small cog in a very large machine. But nevertheless, it was necessary. Down to the man who mixed the cement and built the damn thing. I was a very minor, tiny part of it. But I give my right arm to do it again. We are all extremely proud of being Normandy veterans because of the success of the whole thing. It was an amazing feat, an absolutely amazing feat. Early in February 1944, I was serving in Delhi 
as Director of Transportation Southeast Asia Command under our Admiral Mountbatten. And one never to be forgotten early evening, I received a signal which said, report to the Director of Transportation War Office immediately. I naturally wondered whether my sins had caught up with me because it was a very peremptory signal. Anyhow, two days later, or two and a half days later, it took that time in those days to go from Delhi to London, via Cairo, uh, Malta, Gibraltar, and so to England. I arrived in London and found myself posted as the Director of Ports and Inland Water Transport of the 21st Army Group, which was the British and Canadian half of the operation. My task as Director of Ports and Waterways was one, together with the Navy, to plant the harbour, which was codenamed Mulberry, at Aramanche. Two, to discharge the supply ships all along the British and Canadian beaches. Three, if possible, to open the French ports of port en bassin which was on our right flank, and Wistrom, which was on our left flank, if possible, to open those ports, and also to operate the Wistrom Corn Canal as a, land, as a line of communication. That was how I came into the operation. <coughs> well, as you know, every battle depends on supplies. Men, guns, ammunition, food. No supplies, no battle. That's the basic basis of war. And when the planners were planning well, I call it the invasion, in 1942, the question of supplying the forces over the beaches was the, a, a very serious problem. They decided, on looking at the problem, that they dare not risk, dare not risk an invasion which depended only on supplies coming over the beaches. And there were two reasons for this. On the Normandy beaches, there's a 23-foot rise and fall of tide. The tide goes out half a mile at low tide. Now, you can only discharge a landing craft to the beach an hour or so either side of high tide. Otherwise, you'll be, depending on your draft, but uh, otherwise you'll be grounded. Now, that meant that the hours in which you could discharge supplies was very limited. Not 24 hours, but just the limit at either side of high tide. And that would be insufficient to support a major battle at its start. That was one reason. The second reason was that in the event of a storm, you can't discharge over the beaches at all. And in the event, as it so happened, there was this unexpected gale which started on the 19th of June and raged for four days, and no supplies came over the beaches. Now, had we been dependent on the beaches, the battle could have dried up. So that was the position the planners found themselves in 1942. We dare not risk having an invasion which depended only on supplies coming over the beaches. And there was only one solution to that, and that was to have a port which could operate 24 hours a day at all states of the tide. Now, the Germans knew that, and so they fortified the French ports very heavily. They prepared them for demolition to make sure that even if you captured a port, you wouldn't be able to use it for two or three weeks, which is what happened when Cherbourg was captured. And in fact, at the time, they announced that if we hold the ports, we hold Europe, and they were absolutely correct. And that was the position of the planners in 1942. And they came to the conclusion that unless we can have a port, there would be no invasion. Well, one day um, after a morning of meetings with Captain Petrie, um, 
he and I went to the in and out club in Piccadilly to lunch. He was a member and he took me to lunch. <coughs> and it was customary in those days when you went out to lunch to take your locked black bag, the ordinary standard issue, with all your documents in it, and to put them under the table between your legs to try and remember that they were still there. Well, we had our lunch. We got up and went back to Norfolk House, which was about a quarter of a mile. It's in St. James's Square. Uh, to a, he brought his back, bag, but I'd left mine behind. And uh, I can still, to this day, tremble as, and as I remember my feelings that morning when I rang up the, the club and the hall porter, in a very calm voice, I said, I've left a bag, but yes, sir, thank you very much. We found a grand, a black bag, on, and it's here in my, you know, in the bottom. I can't tell you my relief to know that it was there. I literally, I'm not exaggerating, ran the quarter of a mile. Don't know what anybody thought of me, seeing a galloping brigadier, but uh, uh, from Norfolk House to the club to retrieve the bag. It was still locked, and uh, I opened it and checked uh, the documents that I'd had for the meeting. I reported to intelligence, thinking and hoping, literally hoping, that I would go to the tower and be shot because the strain was so terrific. Because in the bags were plans which showed where the Mulber, la where the landing would be in Normandy, not the Carpard de Calais. Well, I moved down to Selsey, lived in a, ha a, a beach house there for about three days before D-Day, and then embarked with, uh, Adm with Captain Petrie and his ship, HMS Aristocrat. We embarked at 2.30 in the afternoon of D-Day, uh, in his ship, HMS Aristocrat, a very highly noble <laughs> ship to embark on, and we arrived offshore in the darkness the next morning. And I, I, I've never forgotten, or, well, I've often looked back at uh, my very first sight of Aramanche that morning, as it was, exactly like the photographs we'd studied before D-Day. And I can still remember my excitement, because the challenge was on, which was very exciting, and uh, that was, uh, that's how I arrived there. Um, I, as I've said on, in another film, when you ask me about D-Day, what was it like, I can remember a little of D, D, D plus one itself, but for most of the time, I can remember nothing. I was, now, I was so tired, my officer said to me, I said every order twice or three times to make sure I'd, I'd said it right, you know. One was so tired, it was every man jack of that port construction force threw his heart and soul into saving the harbour, and we did. Mm -hmm.